Lucien Freud is one of Britain's most prominent figurative painters. Figurative art is a form of art where the works, although often eccentric and unique, still contain discernible references to real life things you can see, like different people or different objects. Modern figurative art can be compared to general forms of expressionism, so Picasso for the painting, Giacometti for the sculpture, and other greats of the movement. After the Second World War, we can see the continued development of figurative art as a movement through the School of London artists like Francis Bacon or Lucien Freud. This exhibition was truly major because it showcased a lifetime of his work and really demonstrated how his style evolved as well as his interest as an artist. There were many paintings of prominent figures, like the famous portrait of the Queen, but as you progressed through the hall, you saw how he began to move to more intimate studies of friends and family, painting his studio rather than abstract backgrounds. When you first hear the name Freud, you can't help but think of Sigmund Freud. Kind of valid because Lucian is his grandson. However, I think that's a little bit redundant because Lucian Freud was a great artist, intensely private, intensely personal, but nevertheless, all his work is filled with emotion. I want to prompt you to explore the exhibition for yourself, so I won't be talking about every single work or indeed even the most famous ones. Instead, I wanted to highlight the three works that stood out for me. Hotel Bedroom. This was easily one of the most effective pieces of the exhibition for me and one which I spent the longest time admiring. The woman is lying in bed with white sheets pulling up to her shoulders. She's wrapping them around herself, attempting to establish comfort and warmth, but her expression is haunted, cold, distant. It's a sharp contrast to the coziness of the white bed. She's daydreaming, and by her expression, it's a sad dream, one of longing. But she's not actually a woman as much as a young girl. She's greatly aged by her sadness. The romance of the Parisian sunlight is blocked by the figure of a dark form looming over her, her husband. The man is likely Freud, and the woman is the first woman he eloped with after the divorce from his first wife. The work reflects the anxiety of their relationship, which ultimately ended tragically. The work feels flat, but I think what makes it feel so 3D, what makes it lure you in, making you feel as if you're in the room, and is the dark figure of the artist, especially his expression. It's hard to describe the emotion on his face. It's one of deep anguish and almost hate, if I can say that. Perhaps he's so anguished that their love didn't work out, because ultimately this idyllic scene is just a dream, a desperate last moment of happiness together. Evening in the studio. It's a close-up of sags, imperfections, and most of all, flesh. Every rolling layer of flesh is carefully explored. The way the light plays it, you can see every curve of the body. It's not romanticized, but it's not made ugly either. What makes it special for me is that there's a sort of beauty in the nature of it all in Freud's presentation of this woman as simply human, as not a figure of revolution or female beauty standards, as not a symbol of eroticism or anything else. This is just a very intimate painting of a natural human woman. There's a deep tenderness to it, and Freud simply paints the reality with his own take on it. Freud is famous for being quite demanding of his models. He would ask them to model in sometimes difficult or uncomfortable situations for hours. I think this is potentially an exception, or maybe not, but it seems very relaxed and again very private. But the two men just cannot escape the intensity of Freud's gaze, his artist's eye for details, his talent for expression. The pose seems casual, but it is more than a little provocative with the closed man resting his hand on the naked man's cough. It would seem that the naked man is more exposed, but we cannot see his face whereas the expression on the closed model's face is like a window into his soul for the viewer. I love the way Freud's generally sort of flat style enhances the picture. The closed man seems to be almost anchoring the naked man because of their perspective together. They seem like a couple that is made for each other, and it is that delicate intimacy that adds a sense of romance to the picture, even with the somewhat dingy, grey, unromantic background. Romance in even the most unexpected situations. Freud once again exposes human existence through the tenderness of the flesh. This piece in particular seems to me as a captivating portrayal of human bodies and our interaction with others.
this was a fairly small exhibition, so I'll keep the sneak peek to the point as well. Eva Gonzalez was the only form of pupil Monet ever had, and she was a rising artist who managed to defy expectations about what women could and could not paint. Her work was reviewed positively, but most of the reviews were a discussion of her feminine technique and the skill of Box of the Cedar de Zitalien was characterized as masculine. Basically, they said it's so good you probably had a male artist painted and rejected the work. I wanted to highlight this work here because it was actually on display and it was gorgeous. The female figure is Jean Gonzalez, Eva's sister, and the male figure is actually Eva's future husband. The two are standing in Paris' hotspot for seeing Italian operas. Like British theater, there was a tendency to go to the theater as a social event and way to showcase your prosperity, so everyone would be fabulously trapped. The man and the woman are very detached, they are not emotionally connected at all. The painting style resembles Manet's early paintings with the dark colors and the somewhat flat viewpoint. This is a very provocative painting in that John is so clearly uninterested in the man and actively dominant. While Eva's future husband is very handsome and cold, he's not the main subject of this piece. Jean renders him useless. Jean also holds binoculars and she seems very sophisticated and intellectual, focused on the play rather than the man behind her, again asserting her control. Small Smart and pretty. Yeah, at the time, women could never, apparently, so this painting caused quite the riot. I also really like that because the exhibition was not big, the museum had the space and they actively utilized that space by showcasing revolutionary female artists. For example, here is Laura Knight drawing herself looking at a nude model. At the time, women weren't permitted to paint from naked models. There's also a portrait of Mary Moser, one of the only two female founders of the Royal Academy of Arts. Moser is depicted in classical robes. Again, scandalous. And similarly, Angela Lika Kaufman, the other founder, her self-portrait shows her in a neoclassical dress. Like Manet, Gonzalez's work was never shown at the Impressionist exhibitions in Paris, though they are often considered Impressionist because of the style. I really like this mini showcase of female artists' work, and it was also the perfect transition to move on to the Impressionists. It is hard to believe that the term Impressionist was first used as an insult because of an 1874 Paris Exhibitionist. Names that have now gone down in history like Manet, Renoir, Degas, Pissarro, furious that the Parisian snobby art society would not accept them, they set up their own exhibition. An exhibition filled with dreamy landscapes from urban and rural life painted in bright colors. They painted outdoors rather than in a stuffy studio, applying brush strokes quickly and precisely. Often elements of the outdoors, like sand, would be caught in the paint. The paintings were immediate. A beautiful snapshot of a delicate moment in time, reflecting the artist's reality rather than being depictions of great myths as was the common occupation at the time. The shimmering lily ponds, dainty flower arrangements, and misty skies are so incredibly romantic. This is what makes Impressionism so special for me. It's an escape into beauty and aesthetics. The Impressionists today are the artists that everyone has heard of. No matter how far away from art you are, you have seen the water lilies, or even though that's technically post-Impressionist, you've seen Van Gogh's Starry Night. Now, because of recent events, you've seen Van Gogh's Sunflowers. Don't worry, here they are, as beautiful as ever. Impressionism is one of my favorite movements, so seeing these works in the original was a true gift. Rewatching this video now makes me feel like I'm right there in the landscapes, almost as vivid and alive as if I was just living my own life in the present.
get the party started. This was the biggest water stones. Eight floors, six of them devoted to books, working since 1999 and housing more than 150,000 books. You can literally find any book here. Three hours is not enough. Oh wait, let's be honest, no hours are enough? You can come back here for the rest of your life and that's what I'm planning to do. I did somehow manage to settle on just two books, a birthday present from myself, and I will talk about all birthday books in another video. So just enjoy the beautiful temptation of delicious paper before your eyes mm, feeling hungry no problem because it's a pre-birthday trip let's go get sweet stuff to fuel my sugar addiction sitting in your room working on my first record skip to the present and it's still high After we had tea and don't laugh at me, but I felt so British at that moment. I've never felt more British in my entire life, even though I'm not even remotely British. We walked to the oldest bookstore in London, Hatchers. Of course, that was my idea. But I know it's probably getting a little tiring to look at footage of books, so instead, I wanted to show you some lovely footage of Night London. We decided to go to see the musical Life of Pi, so we walked around for a little bit before it started. We visited Chinatown, and that especially was the highlight for me chinatown was so beautiful with all the lanterns and all the lights and all the busy hustle and the smell of food so it was just such a nice and lovely break to take from all this studying i've been doing and all the exams so i'm just so happy and so fortunate that i had this opportunity to go out with my godmother life of pi was fantastic i didn't expect such a wonderful adaptation the actors were brilliant it was such a thought-provoking and emotional piece i just want to say thank you for watching day one <laughs> forgive me for my voice it's a little bit hoarse i currently have a little bit of a cold kipu is an andean method of recording everything using structures of strands and textiles here the artist recreated the ancient method of kipu but put a modern take on it whereas in the ancient method the textiles are usually bright and colorful this pale structure is in memory of destruction of indigenous territories and you can see that in the materials too old wedding dresses and sails it's a beautiful structure it feels almost like a rainforest but it's burned down and the history is sad and solemn, almost like the world itself is hanging by its threads. It's a monumental work and I really loved and highly recommend that everyone sees it for themselves. The next exhibition I would like to spotlight is Maria Bertisova's work. She was born in Prague and she worked with plaster mainly, taking inspiration from organic forms. She used the idea of clay setting being a liquid and quick process to make solid artworks that were at the same time incredibly delicate and required careful technique. The exhibition displayed an impressive 30 years of her work. I love the way she carefully shaped everything either by hand or water or by balloon it's an almost unreal shape that feels like it should belong in our world and yet is so otherworldly. A lot of these sculptures I'm showing you are repurposed small rubber balloons and condoms. Bertusova would use the gravitational pull of plaster to shape the piece and then she would often dip them with water. She called this method gravity stimulated shaping and she usually left her works either untitled or called them living forms, like 
drop. In the 80s, her style emerged, and she began to do what she called pneumatic casting. She poured plaster over balloons, and then she shaped them during the process. This is how she got these hollow shapes and egg-like spheres. Sometimes she would put many balloons, her series that she titled Endless Eggs. She basically layered the shells to build a hollow interior. The idea was based on Venus and showed fertility and motherhood. Although her main medium was plaster, she also experimented with cheap materials like aluminum or bronze. She would fold them and experiment with a geometric language. I really admire her for not being very possessive of her work. She allowed it to be taken outside and placed in nature for photography or often just left it there, viewing it as a return to nature. She even took part in a workshop for blind children. Her enlarged sculptures could be reassembled and taken apart, and this allowed for children to engage with them and see the movement of geometric and organic forms, and look how happy they are. I would particularly like to spotlight this relief too. It's called Melting Snow 1 and features an embedded branch. She placed it at the right edge to go with the principles of Ikebana, the Japanese art of harmony and appreciation of nature. I really liked her integration of Taoism and Zen Buddhism because it's just such a unique look at nature and the plastered mass references the process of freezing and setting snow too. The tied eggs you can see on the wall are actually made in conjunction to this installation. It really reminded me of Russia. There's this plant that I don't know the name of that has white berries. They're unedible but they make a big popping noise if you step on them. I used to do it all the time as a kid and this room really unlocked that childhood memory I completely forgot about. Bruce has his medlen and, well, I have Bertizova's plastered sticks and balloons. I also wanted to show you these photographs of the construction of massive Bertizova sculptures like playgrounds and also as part of the design for the Kosuke crematorium. I wish I got the chance to see the massive sculptures too because honestly I ended up really loving this exhibition and I know I say that about a lot of things because I just like the experience but this one took me by surprise how much it managed to calm my agitated inner feelings and I found a sort of peace at looking at all the shapes and elegant organic forms. That was the only paid exhibition we visited at Tate. We then just walked around to see all the installations that were free to see and I was blown away by how massive the space was. We don't have anything near to this in terms of contemporary art in Russia, national galleries of course, but not contemporary art, so this was just a complete if pleasant shock. Since I'm not going to talk about every single exhibition, only my favorite ones, I just wanted to talk a little bit about my journey to art appreciation while showing some of the exhibitions that were on. Art is not a big thing in my immediate family. My mom and dad know quite a few artists and they have a lot of general knowledge about art, like they know who Rublev is and could probably tell you about the creation process of his icons, but they don't really visit galleries. My mom will actively deny it if I say she's good at drawing, but I remember she used to help me so much with art assignments for primary school. Also, can I just take a moment to say there's a really big distinction between being artistic and being good at art for me. I think an artistic person is just someone who's creative, who finds beauty in art and appreciates beautiful things, someone who can use their hands but also their mind. It's not necessarily just someone who knows how to draw or to paint. I used to take a lot of art lessons as a kid but I was never particularly artistically gifted. Now, wait, I know what you say, you could just practice more, and of course, but some of my cousins are incredibly gifted, like actually gifted. They have a talent, they finish art school, and they can create this amazing work, which I think even with the same amount of practice I would not be able to create, or even conceive. Like, I think there's a difference between practice and talent, and of course you, you can be successful was just a lot of practice, but the combination of practice and talent is what makes that million dollar win. Plus, art was always somewhat of a hobby. Rather than a serious pathway for me, unlike my cousin who's currently studying to be a designer, like honestly, I'm her biggest fan, I love seeing everything she makes, but I'm going off topic. When I took art classes, I was never that interested in actually looking at other people's art. It was fine, I could appreciate the beauty, but I was just too focused on what I was doing. Like, oh, I'm painting a lavender field, I can look at others doing that, and it's beautiful. But what's the point? I'm the one painting a lavender field, I'm the one ultimately doing that, right? It's only in recent years when I actually had less time to paint and stopped taking classes that I found myself actually appreciating art and considering it's in great depth. I'm not sure exactly what prompted it, but suddenly I was visiting art galleries and reading books about art and attending online lectures and thinking about the steps involved in creating it. <laughs> Even doodling in black ink when I'm in the mood. Recently, I've been getting a few comments and messages saying, you're so educated, I love your gallery videos, how did you get into art, how did you learn so much, etc. And 
thank you that's really flattering but i just wanted to show that it's not something exclusive and no i'm not an expert far from it i didn't go to art school i self-learned what i know about art history i'm just interested and when you have that interest of course you'll be following art channels and critics and youtube and reading books and news articles and learning about the greats if you start visiting galleries but you actually evaluate what you saw later and read beyond the simple descriptions on the plaque that's how you learn more that's how you can draw those parallels to for example colonialism and see what the artist is referencing so please don't be daunted by people telling you you need a formal education to understand art and bullying you into thinking you can't enjoy it properly of course you can maybe at first you won't see the exact amount of depth as someone who has that experience but the main thing is that you learn as long as you see these visits as something for yourself and not as a forced activity then i think it's amazing after all it's not about becoming an expert it's just about learning and making the effort i I learn a lot every visit, every article, every YouTube video, and I'm always motivated to find out more because I know that I know nothing. Maybe a little more than the average person, but in the grand scheme, nothing. And that's why my videos about art are just something personal, my own opinions and reflections, rather than a professional lecture. I take the approach of let's all learn together, and I hope that you see it that way too, and that you find my videos engaging and motivational to just go to your nearest galleries and to enjoy that art for yourself. So I hope you enjoyed the rest of this video, and let's keep talking about art! Come with me to the Victoria and Albert Museum. I was so excited once I found out this exhibition was on. It's basically about the Korean wave or Hairu. So in case you don't know, I'm half Korean. Kind of obvious was the surname Kim. But I am what in Korean people call Korean, which means I am a Korean born outside Korea. It's ironic the treatment towards Koreans given that it literally sounds the same to Korean in English, but that's a conversation for another day. I want to give you a brief overview of Korean history like a whirlwind tour. So, in the 20th century, Korea underwent a lot of events. Japan annexed Korea in 1910, following literally years of economic coercion because of the unequal Japan-Korea Treaty in 1876. During the colonial period, there was Japanification, if you can call it that. I mean, I'm also Russian, so I remember Russification from history. Koreans were forced to assimilate to the culture and liberated only at the end of the Second World War. Yay, freedom, right? But no, because then there was the Cold War in 1950. The USA sent troops into South Korea, and the USSR sent troops into North Korea, and they basically fought a proxy war. They both wanted to make Korea either completely communist or completely capitalist, and in the end they withdrew due to UN intervention and heavy losses, but a peace treaty has still not been reached, and that's why Korea is split into North and South. 
Here you can see several things. Poster of the Chosen Hotel, which was basically built on top of a shrine that commemorated the Korean Empire. Instead, Japan demolished it and advertised the hotel, but they kept the pavilion, which was an altar, purely for the entertainment of guests. During the Korean War, there were a lot of propaganda posters and safe passes. Basically, both armies tried to get the enemy soldiers to desert, and you can see that here too. I also really like this installation by Kyung Ah Ham. It's a fallen chandelier because Korea's bright future shattered the moment the Korean War began, because instead of a liberated country, it became a divided one, one still forced into conflict to this very day. The post-war chaos led to a coup in 1961 by Major General Park Chung-hee. Under his regime, he encouraged the growth of chairboard. Small companies like Samsung, LG, Hyundai, they grew with governmental support in order to secure foreign loans. They were the driving force for the rapid economic growth. Censorship was used to control foreign liberal influences and to make sure Korea Korean culture developed. For example, this cup had a plum blossom design because of the law to safeguard Korean original cultural legacy. Park was then assassinated and replaced by another dictator, Major General Chun Do-hwan, in 1980. That decade was marked by student uprisings and protests that were brutally put down. I love Han Kang's book, Human Acts. It covers the tragedy that happened in Guangzhou in a brilliant way. I cried my eyes out and I hope everyone reads it. Another key event was the 1988 Olympics that propelled South Korea onto the global stage. You can see the volunteer uniform here. In the 1990s, there was a rapid growth of internet technologies and today South Korea has one of the fastest internet rates in the world. After that, we move into the 21st century, and Korea has now become the land of K-dramas and K-pop for many. There was an entire hall dedicated to famous K-dramas that hit global success, and also a discussion of the evolution of North Korean characters and K-dramas from the villains to just people, a landmark of progress. But yet, even with all these modern advances, Korea still embraces its traditions, as you can see from the traditional hats often worn in historical dramas and the use of ancient musical instruments. Just look at this display for parasites, wow. If you haven't watched it, go watch the movie right now, but fair warning, I had nightmares about it for an entire week and couldn't stop thinking about how many social issues we have yet to address. I'm guessing you've probably heard of K-pop, unless you live under a rock and prefer to be an internet hermit and not going on the internet at all, K-pop is a massive industry. Take the western fangirls you know and dial it up. K-pop has its own merchandise, the fandom has their own name, and every group has its own light stick. The amount of dancing, money, singing, and effort that goes into a music video is insane. There was also a chance to dance, and I am very sorry for what you're about to witness. <laughs> I'm not recovering from that, I know I can't dance. But there was also a whole tradition of Korean medicine and skincare. Skincare in Korea is very good. And there were also a lot of handbooks and the more modern take on, on handbooks that I thought were beautiful. After the exhibition, we had to leave because the museum was already closing. But 10 minutes before closing time, I suddenly saw these earrings and I literally knew I had to get them. I, I had to decide instantly and I got them five minutes before the checkout closed, so massive win. We then walked around for about an hour through a beautiful night London, which I know I can't shut up about, but it's so beautiful with the lights and the architecture. I'm just so 
so thankful to my godmother for coming and i'm so so lucky to have her our last dinner together was amazing that duck was so good and wow soho incredible really cool and then it was my birthday the very next day and honestly what an incredible way to pre-celebrate my birthday <laughs> the day of it we had birthday breakfast and then headed back to oxford in the evening i spent time with my friends and we talked politics over pizza and cake i hope you enjoyed this video and thank you so much for watching until the end thank you once again elena and see you soon